Hello and welcome. Later this evening, RTE will screen episode four of the TV adaptation of Sally Rooney's novel Normal People, the episode in which protagonists Cullen and Marianne arrive at Trinity College. To mark the occasion, Trinity Development and Alumni is delighted to bring you Ruth Barton, Associate Professor of Film Studies and Head of the School of Creative Arts here at Trinity, in conversation with screenwriter and director Lenny Abrahamson and producer Ed Guiney of Element Pictures. While many people know that Sally Rooney is a Trinity graduate, the creative forces behind bringing normal people to our screens are alumni too. Ed Guiney studied business here and Lenny Abrahamson is a graduate of Mental and Moral Science. In this interview, Professor Barton asked them about the making of the series, the challenges of adapting a novel for the small screen, particularly a novel as beloved as this. She also poses questions submitted by alumni in advance. We hope you'll enjoy it and that it will whet your appetite for the series. My name is Ruth Barton and I'm Head of School of Creative Arts at Trinity College Dublin. And it's my great pleasure to speak this evening to uh, Ed Danny and to Lenny Abramson uh, about normal people. So congratulations, you two. That was just fantastic. I loved it. I've seen four episodes and I thought it was brilliant. Uh, and uh, we're talking in advance of the uh, Trinity, if you like, Trinity um, episodes where the two central characters go to Trinity. Um, but I think it's going to be just about so much this season. And, you know, people are going to love it all around the world. It's not just about Trinity. So fantastic. Um, well done. So this, this is, we're kicking off with the um, episode where Marion and Connell go to Trinity for the first time. And in fact, it opens up with Connell kind of walking through um, front gate, in through the arch. It kind of goes dark and then it goes light again. And he's sort of woken up. It's his dream. He's at Trinity. And of course, you two went to Trinity as well. So I thought we might just kick off with you both reflecting on that moment when you walked through front gate into front square. And, and maybe if you can even think back what your thoughts were when you started off. And then, you know, it might be nice just to talk a little bit about how actually being at Trinity kind of kicked off this relationship. I do remember, yeah, I remember the sort of what felt like the enormity of it, you know, leaving school and starting college. And that would have been, I think I, I think Ed was the, it came a year after me. Ed's a, a, a whippersnapper of a year younger or, or half a year younger than me. Um, and I was, uh, but I remember... I was quite young. I think I was barely 17 um, when I went and probably thinking back on it, maybe a little bit too young. Um, and so that my first uh, weeks there, I was definitely felt, I definitely felt sort of overwhelmed by it. And um, I was also studying sciences, which kept me down the sort of the, the back end in, you know, doing 30 something hours of lectures a week. And I definitely didn't feel like I, at that point, that I was really part of, of this kind of what I could tell was a, a really rich campus life. It took longer, it took a while for me to feel like I was. So I think the first phase of it was, um, felt a little, probably a little bit like Connell, even though I was from a, um, a Dublin family with Trinity connections, um, uh, felt like Connell, but without the advantage of, of, of looking like Connell. So I think that was probably, that's probably my experience of it. Um, I, I mean, I, uh, I really wanted to go to Trinity. My family were all UCD. In fact, my, my dad, uh, was a professor in UCD, a professor of medicine. And I remember telling my, um, maternal grandmother that I wanted to go to Trinity and she was absolutely horrified because she came from the generation when you needed to get permission from the archbishop, uh, if you were, if you, as a Catholic, if you want to go to Trinity, but I was very set on it. I always wanted to go there and I had very romantic notions of it. Uh, and in fact, I, uh, I applied to do drama and English and it was, I think the first year of the drama course, first year ever. And I got accepted, but my very sensible father, uh, thought that I should do something more practical. So I ended up doing ESS, which is now BESS, I think. Um, which was brilliant because it was only eight hours of lectures a week, which was, you know, fantastic. Uh, and quite early on, I think I gravitated towards players because uh, I had an interest in, obviously, interest in uh, theatre and film and stuff like that. Um, so they, that was my entry into it, I guess. We'd met, you know, when we were about 14 or 15. So... Um... And, and just, I don't know if you want to go into it now, but the, 
the beginnings of the working relationship would have been a little bit after that. Well, um, I, I had known Ed then and we probably hadn't been in touch for about a year or so. And then Ed phoned me up uh, with this idea of setting up a filmmaking society in Trinity. We'd always talked about films um, and uh, as, as in so many of the things in what I've gone on to do, it was Ed's idea. And uh, I thought this was great. And we set up a, what is now DU Filmmakers, I think, and mm -hmm. still, still going. Um, and the first very, very tentative <laughs> steps in our careers were taken there. So yeah, it goes, the, 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 the whole thing really begins in Trinity. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, that have been sent in to us. And I'm just going to ask you the first one. Um, this is from Imogen Pollard. And it's, uh, did you both feel pressure in both producing Ed, Normal People, which is beloved by readers worldwide, and Lenny, adapting the novel to suit a TV format and audience? So let's just, let's just you know, tease out a little bit how, how you went through that adaptation process and, and how also you worked with Sally Rooney, who is, is one of the um, scriptwriters. It sort of felt very obvious to me that um, it was uh, something that Lenny would respond to, that it was a piece for television. And so I shared the book with Len and he you know, absolutely uh, saw the possibilities with it. Um, and at the same time, um, Rose Garnett, who's a great friend of ours, who's the head of BBC Films, uh, read the book. And we talked about how we might actually get the rights because it was such a competitive environment. Um, and of course, the other thing is when we bought the book, it wasn't, it wasn't the phenomenon it, phenomenon it has become. I mean, no one had read it, you know, at that stage. So, um, so we kind of had a very, I suppose, pure reaction to it in that sense. And although I don't think we're even a tiny bit surprised that it's become the thing it's become, it, it sort of, it was really just about how do we honor this? How do we make the very best version of it? That was, that was really the kind of sort of quite pure conversation at that stage. I'll let Len pick up. So the second part of the question was about, you know, did you feel it was a pressure? And I think, yes, as, I mean, we certainly were aware as things went on that the book was becoming this huge thing and, you couldn't, everywhere you go, you saw people reading it and people talking about it. I think having Sally be such a, a central part of the process because she, she was interested right from the beginning in being part of the screenwriting process. And she turns out never having written for the screen before, she's an excellent screenwriter. And she, her, she wrote the first six and then she had to, um, she needed to do work on the novel that she was uh, working on. So we brought in this wonderful writer, Alice Birch, to work alongside her. And Alice was to write then the, the final six bar one, which would Marco Rowe wrote. Um, but having Sally as a writer and also as an executive producer on it, I suppose, was a way for us to make sure that we were, it was an added uh, guarantor in a way that we would be true to the essence of the book. Um, and then I think once you get into the process, you just become so kind of caught up in that, that there isn't really time to think about um, whether fans are going to hate you or feel that you've ruined their precious um, memories in some way. And you always have to sort of back yourself anyway and just do what you feel is, is right. Um, but, I, but I think the point at which we all felt strongly that, that there was something very special and that it was, we had somehow a chance at capturing the essence of the book is when we cast Daisy and Paul because they're so great together. They so they seem to so embody those characters. It was hard for us to look at them playing the scenes and not feel that we were on the right, you know, we were on the scent of the, of, of the central kind of uh, essence of the book. One of the, the interesting things about it is their relationship and you've kept very true to the book in, in, in that sense that their relationship, um, which is very, obviously very complicated, it's also really a relationship of mine as, as, as well as a physical relationship. And, and, you know, I was interested even in that, in the, in the, in the first Trinity encounter, if you like, or the first moment in Trinity is in the classroom. And, and they have a scene where the group is in English and they're discussing you know, the topic of the day. And that's a scene that could have been, in another production, would have been laughed at um, because it would have been seen as sort of, you know, quote, unquote, pretentious. Um, but, but, but you take very seriously, as the book takes very seriously, having an intellectual relationship. And mm -hmm. 
And, and I wonder, you know, if you'd like to talk a little bit about that, because that is, that's really something that's very distinctive about it. That, that, that's a really good question, because we did a lot of work to, you know, because obviously, you know, you've got to flesh out some of those scenes when you put them on, on, on the screen, because the book can, can pick and choose what's referred to. But once you've got a seminar playing, you're going to hear what the people say, and you're going to listen to his answer, and you have to cast the people. And, and yes, we did take that really seriously and took really seriously the representation of students to be truthful and um, to be accurate, to try to think hard about what it was people were saying in these various conversations. You know, when, again, when Connell has an argument with a couple of guys or a discussion with a couple of the guys in the conversation room of, of one of the debating societies about, you know, whether or not they should know platform this guy. Like we did spend a lot of time getting that, I think, right. So that it isn't just, you know, so that it does justice to the sorts of people that really inhabit those places and, and it isn't a caricature. Um, and, and I, yeah, we take, I think all of us take some pride in the fact that that's, it's done as authentically as we were capable of doing it and does try to avoid taking the mickey out of people just because that's often an easy thing to do. But, and I, and I would say, I wondered when we were, and I had, you, you, we, we can think back, I'm sure both of us to conversations where we said, I wonder, will there be sort of a, a backlash of people who think this is just about a bunch of privileged um, you know, kids um, who don't know anything about the real world. And, but, but I think if you treat anybody seriously and, and you, you render them truthfully with their foibles and complexities, it's hard not to feel that it's reasonable to discuss them. You know, every, you know there's nothing wrong with representing people as, uh, if you do it as they are. Um, and yeah, so that, and, and also what you say about Marianne and Connell, it was so interesting like Sally does this thing, she like in the novel, which is so unusual, she does eroticize communication, you know, and intelligence. Like what really excites them both is the idea that the other one can see them and really see and sort of they play games with each other. And they, they in, in, a, in a world, particularly for Connell, where it is just not cool to, to do that, he, he just his native intelligence is such that he can't help loving as well as being slightly terrified of. The, the 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 sort of the, the little cuts and thrusts that that Marianne makes and and how and that that idea of being able to to play in a, at an en, in an intellectual context is kind of sexy for the two of them so you absolutely have to get that right and the two actors have to be clever enough themselves to to for us to really believe that that's happening yeah, I mean, I, that's really your casting, as you say, your casting is absolutely key to it, because I think one of the kind of the really interesting things about it is it, it just demolishes certain stereotypes, because Paul is at once, like he's, you know, he's a country guy, he, he plays sport, he hangs around the guys, he goes to the pub, and he's quite inarticulate, certainly in, in the beginning. Um, so again, you know, in another film, he's a certain stereotype, and, and then, you know, in another film, he meets cool, cool sort of a uh, cosmopolitan young woman, and she plays games with him. Um, but it's not Lady Chatterley's lover, and 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 so it's it's that casting. And I think you know they're both fantastic at very gradually sort of um, letting their personalities emerge on screen through that through that that very complex relationship with each other. And yeah. Sort of be, sorry, then go ahead. No, I was actually going to suggest you you say it. Ed. No, no, I, I, I said this before, but I, it's, it's worth repeating. I think it's true. I mean, that um, what's really interesting about um, Sally's characters is that they are so fully rendered and so human um, that you kind of, I certainly had the experience with both her books of kind of putting them down and feeling um, like a little bit bereft that I left these people and this world behind, even though it's like, she challenges her characters. I mean, she puts them, she gives them a hard time, but there's a humanity uh, at the center of that that's ultimately, I think, quite reassuring um, and inherent in the characters. And you sort of feel like that they kind of somewhere, exist somewhere in your kind of sphere as real human beings, as, you know, rather than characters in a novel. And I think Lenny has a similar gift as a filmmaker where he kind of, can remove the lens between you and the characters on screen 
And um, so they cease to be fictional characters and somehow merge into your kind of um, wider group of human, the wider group of human relationships that you have as an individual. And I, I really felt that at uh, definite points during the making of the show where I'd see a cut of something. I remember seeing an early cut of episode five, which is an, a really wonderful episode. Um, and uh, there's an incredible conversation between Marianne and Connell in that episode, a really intense, really inspiring, open, honest, you know, positive uh, kind of exploration of their relationship at that point. And I, like, I was stunned by it, but then later on that day, I kind of had that sort of um, ghost of a memory, which you often have if you've had a really intense conversation with somebody at some point recently, you remember it. And I kind of remembered that, seen as a very intense conversation that I'd had with somebody, but then realized actually, no, no, no. It was what I watched this morning. It was, you know, the assembly of, of episode five, but it's so kind of vivid and rich. And that's a, that's a phenomenal gift. And I think, um, you know, it's not to be underestimated how difficult it is to take um, Sally's work and actually do it justice. I think you need sort of the equivalent um, talent on the directing side as, you know, Sally manifests in, in the writing side. And I think had we, you know, collectively not got that right, um, you're dead. You're just making a kind of a, a soft sort of teen romance that doesn't have the edge and, and doesn't really um, feature, you know. And of course the cast have an incredible, you know, they're really very much part of that, but it's also how you work with the cast and how you enable them um, because no matter how good an actor you are, if you're not well directed, if you're not working in the right environment, it's very, very hard to kind of properly do justice to characters of that depth, I think. Actually, I have, I have another question from some, some, some I have a question for Lenny Abramson. Uh, this is from Jesse Dolliver. Me and my sister have just graduated from university, me with a science degree and her with a film degree. I love the films she makes, but she is so critical of them all. Surely you have to keep practicing and making films to be completely proud of them. What advice would you give her about staying motivated to grow as a filmmaker? So that's what would, just... Her sister's got very good instincts. Keep making things and that's how you get better at it. And believe me, nobody starts off um, making perfect work. Like, you know, in the, in the archive of DU filmmakers, there may be some major skeletons, um, you know, in, in their closet, uh, I would say um, it's doing it that makes you better at it. And and the one thing, the one advice I would give is not just to keep doing it, but do, as Ed sort of mentioned, challenge yourself to try and do it at a level. Like, don't let yourself go off the hook. Try and um, approach actors who you think might be just ever so slightly out of your league and, you know, D d um, take yourself seriously even if it's a small thing that you're funding yourself or making on your iphone take that seriously but but keep going uh, you won't discover you don't discover quickly whether it's for you or not and and it may or may not be you know but you're not going to find that out unless you work really hard at it for quite a bit of time and and then you'll you'll have a better idea so in a way, shooting normal people was a return home for you to, you, you knew your way around Trinity. And, and did that make a difference when you were shooting that you were so familiar with, with the space that you were shooting in? It was very satisfying to, to you know, having been there for quite a while, in my case, uh, to come back and get to film it, having, you know, absorbed it at an, at an important point in my own life. Um, but actually, in the end, you always go through the same process, whether you no or don't uh, a location you visited several times you wreck it with crew and particularly with Susie Lavalle who somebody we haven't mentioned absolutely brilliant cinematographer that was that shot my block um uh, of the show and the, the there is also a sort of danger inherent in knowing somewhere very well which is that you can assume things are clear that would that aren't clear to somebody who doesn't know it so you always have to put yourself in the position of of somebody else watching this having said all that um, yeah, there were a few places like I did live in the rubrics and shooting outside the rubrics at that particular time in the evening when the, the lights almost gone. I, that was really satisfying for me. And then I studied a lot on the top floor of the Berkeley. Um, and I always used to try and get this particular desk because I just liked it. 
and we we put Paul at that desk when he was studying and because I know I just knew what that felt like and I, I I just it was just yeah there was just those those little things which make it very personal but actually shooting in Ireland generally I think at you degree you know it's all very storied and it all interlinks with your history one way or the other. I think it's sort of really fascinating to see how Dublin as it's depicted and Ireland as it's depicted in normal people and indeed in conversations but you know, more, more uh, relevantly normal people for the purposes of this conversation, how that sort of goes out into the world. Because it's an Ireland that actually doesn't conform to the expectations that most people have. I'm always stunned, still stunned, by what American people think of Ireland. And even British people think of Ireland. We saw that through the whole Brexit thing. And um, I'm in many ways very proud of the Ireland that we depict in normal people. Um, because it does show a kind of, there's a sense of a multicultural country, there's a sense of a kind of a liberalism, an openness, um, a kind of, uh, a, a, kind of a, a, a sort of a, a, a busy, um, you know, uh, relatively benign uh, European country. I mean, to the extent that, you know, uh, uh, you can call it absolutely benign, but there's, it's a, you know, it's a good place to be, I think now certainly in the world that we live in. And I think that's really interesting. I think how, that, how that's seen by the world is, is gonna be fascinating. And actually how that's even seen by Irish people is gonna be interesting because we've never seen, I don't think we've seen, you know, when you get to again, episode five and you see the kind of the world that kind of um, Marianne's friends and habits and stuff like that, it's never been seen before on Irish screens. And I think that's really quite interesting as well. And it goes back to the question about sort of, you know, what expectations do you have about these types of people and these types of characters? Um, and I think Lenny really dispelled that question with what Richard did, which was set in a sim similar world and did make you empathize with someone who was quite privileged ultimately. Um, but I think, uh, anyway, it's, 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 I'm really interested, you know, just personally to see how that plays out. Um, so just, I think, maybe wrapping up and talking about keeping going on things, you might like to talk to us a little bit about conversations with friends. I know that that's the next project, or I think that that's the next project. Um, so what do we have to look forward to there? It's, it's, I mean, it's quite early days in a way. Um, we've just started the process of writing the script, so they're forming, and Alice Birch, who worked with us on Normal People, will also be working on, is also writing on conversations with friends. And... I mean, the show is, is you know, is, is kind of financed and ready to go. And it's really, I guess there's a big question about when we can choose it. I mean, just given where we are right now and, you yeah. know, kind of, you know, the end of April 2020. Um, uh, but we, we, I think we're real, realizing that we will probably have to make it uh, in this environment. In other words, when coronavirus is still a thing. So that's a whole kind of other dimension to how we work and, uh, and we're trying to figure that out. Um, but it's really exciting. And I think that what we're really determined to do is to do something. I mean, Conversations with Friends is, a, is, is, is obviously Sally's book and it's set in a similar kind of world in some ways, but it's a very, very different book also. Um, and I think what we're really excited by is not making a follow-up to normal people, but making something kind of that's very much its own thing um, in all kind of dimensions. Uh, and that we sort of really challenge ourselves to, to do that differently and to bring a different kind of um, creative dynamic to bear in terms of that. Yeah, Lenny, do you want to, because I think you're going to be directing it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, yes, absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't say no to it. It's, I love the book and um, have, I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, really actively enjoyed working on normal people. And so there was just no way I couldn't have bear, bear to, to not be involved in conversations. and. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I think, yeah, it will have its own very distinct personality. And, and part of the, the almost one of the most pleasurable parts of this process for me making anything is, are, are those early um, framing some conversations that you have with people about what it's really going to feel like. It's, it's the point at which practicality hasn't intruded and you can really just try to find its best form or the best form so i look forward to that and then ed and i have various projects um to to follow that uh, you know hope to uh, there are a couple of feature film projects one with uh, marco halloran again which is really exciting and 
and then this uh, Emil Griffith boxing story, which I've talked about a lot, and other other television and other film projects. So, you know, uh, it, it's it's exciting to think about um, the next few years, assuming we get to to do all the things that are in the pipeline. Yeah, fantastic. It's just so much to look forward to. But um, for now, congratulations and um, just thank sit you. back and enjoy the praise. It's so well deserved. And um, thank you both. Thank you both for um, Thanks, Ruth. It was really thanks, Ruth. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Hello again, and thanks for tuning in. You've been watching Ruth Barton, head of Trinity School of Creative Arts, in conversation with Lenny Abrahamson and Ed Guiney, the creative forces bringing Sally Rooney's novel, Normal People, to our screens. I'd like to thank them for taking time out of their busy schedules to do this interview for us. And thanks too to those alumni who submitted questions in advance. Good night.